Hello there. There is a wind of change at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. First, there is the apology issued to Native American Sachin Littlefeather. Then, there is the election of Janet Yang as the first Asian American woman president. Could this mean a new age for gender and racial diversity in Hollywood? Let's find out. Sachin Littlefeather showed up at the 1973 Oscars in place of award winner Marlon Brando. Her appearance was a protest against Native American stereotypes in Hollywood. But the old guard was not happy, and there was a backlash. In the words of the Academy, that appearance resulted with Littlefeather being boycotted professionally and attacked personally for the last 50 years. In a recent apology, the Academy explained it's now committed to stand with indigenous voices and dedicated to fostering an inclusive industry. And the good news is that it's already begun to back up that claim. Janet Yang has been elected as Academy president. She's the first Asian American woman to take that title. After the Oscars So White movement, the Academy announced it was taking measures to bring diversity to its operations. And news outlets say it's been good on that promise. Reportedly, since 2020, the Academy has doubled the number of its female and non-white members. That in turn has pushed the number of members from 6,000 to 10,000. Yang's election is hailed as the latest stride in that direction. Her peers say she has already paid her dues through her work on member recruitment and the board. Vanity Fair adds that she's also famous for mentoring Asian American filmmakers and is involved in organizations like Gold House, which promote diversity. So with the apology to Little Feather and Yang's presidency, the tide for equality at the Academy may eventually be turning for the better. Let's turn to journalist Sarah Teta. Hi, Sarah. Very good to have you with us today. Thanks so much. Now, the Academy, for the first time in its history, has an Asian-American woman as the president. Well, it's great, of course, but I want to start with this. Why did it take such a long time? I think it's such great news that Janet Young has been appointed as a president. It's amazing. But you're right, it has been a long time coming. And for that, we're very thankful. I think in Hollywood, it's important to look at the future. It has taken a long time to get this to this point, but alas, we are here and now we have to celebrate. I'm so excited to see what she's going to bring to the table. And also very excited for the young people up and coming who have got someone to aspire to. I have many Asian friends who, are, who, who often say, oh, in TV, where, where are our role models? Who can we aspire to? And now... Janet has been given this amazing position, sat at the top of the table, and I know she's got so many great, great plans. So for me, it's not about why has it taken so long. Yes, it has taken a long time, but we are here now and we're going to celebrate that and run with it. Janet, we've got your back. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah, it's so good to hear that you're so positive and convinced about the whole situation. But there are some people uh, I know who are a little bit more concerned. I mean. I heard this argument, I mean, I, I've read it on internet, for example, that it's very trendy to jump on the diversity bandwagon and, uh, you know, just be a little bit tokenist, so to say, and, you know, have this female Asian uh, president and, you know, I don't know, uh, people of color in key positions, etc. But then how can we get convinced that change is not only happening on the facade of things? Well, we have to make make sure as a people, as a collective, that it's not just a token. We want to see more employers take on people of different diverse backgrounds, um, inclusive um, disabilities, hidden disabilities, and ones that are seen, you know? It's a modern day, it's a new day. Yes, there've been a lot of demonstrations with obviously Black Lives Matter, and um, just generally throughout the history, there's been so much going on, but, it's our role as the next generation of people to see that it's not a token. Let's keep up the momentum. With Janet's um, role, we want to see more people 
of her descent, more people of all different descents, just getting the top jobs as well, as well as um, English people, white people, everyone, we all deserve to have the same opportunity. So let's hope that going forward, it's not just going to be a token. It's going to be something that stays for good. All right. Well, do you think it would be more meaningful to cancel, perhaps, Oscars and come up with alternatives and build new communities rather than trying to fix Oscars year after year with new topics, etc. I mean, uh, do you think that trying to transform Oscars makes more sense than that? I think we should definitely not cancel the Oscars because it's a huge part of um, our well, American heritage that around the world is a huge, huge, big event. It's the, the glitziest event in showbiz, let's face it. And yes, there's so sometimes it can be a bit dull, but in previous years or this year, as we've seen, it was lively again. So, you know, I don't think it's about cancelling something. I think it's about ad up, um, updating it and adapting so it fits everyone, so everyone's included. It's... It's um, one of the biggest dates in the calendar and I would not like to see it cancelled, just improved, you know. Mm -hmm. So you believe that a real improvement is possible in a system that was built on um, obviously old systems and old techniques and old dynamics? Definitely, mm -hmm. because it's a new generation of people coming in um, for the Oscars. It's not just the older generation. It's a new generation of people with more diverse views, more welcoming. So I think it's about upholding the good things about the Oscars and celebrating the things that we were hidden before and coming up with a format that just represents everybody and that's fair for everybody and that celebrates great achievement across everyone. All right, as for one last question, Oscars obviously apologized uh, for Sachin Little, Little Feather. 50 years after uh, the Brando protest. Do you find it to be meaningful coming at this point? I was so touched when I heard about the apology, not just because of the apology from the Oscars, but from Little Feather's reaction. I thought it was beautiful. She said, it's been 50 years coming, but we finally got it. And we've got to have a sense of humour about it. We must always keep a sense of humour about it. I mean, what a role model. Obviously, Native Americans, the struggle is real. They've been through so much. And to finally be acknowledged for her speech and what she went through, she was jeered backstage and by the crowd just because she stood up for Marlon Brando not being there to accept his Oscar because he was so into protesting for Native American rights. And there she was, a brave young woman in her 20s at the time, coming out and standing up for him. However, it was almost like the nail in the coffin for her career afterwards. For 50 years, she's had to suffer and, you know, it's, it's been hard. But now, it's, it's late, better let, late than never, we say. Or in the words of uh, Lizzo, it's about damn time. She got the apology and now we're all celebrating. Well, Sarah, it's really um, so much, it gives me so much joy to see all these changes uh, lifted up your spirits. It was very good to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us on Showcase today. The Marvel Cinematic Universe continues to draw attention to strong female characters with live action features. It all began with Captain Marvel having her own solo sci-fi movie. Then there was a female master spy, Black Widow. And now She-Hulk has her own comedy series on a streaming platform. She-Hulk, or Jennifer Walters, first appeared in American comic books published by Marvel Comics in 1980. The fictional character is a lawyer who specializes in superhuman-oriented legal cases, and she became green after receiving an emergency blood transfusion from her cousin, Bruce Banner. Then, she became part of the famous series The Avengers and The Fantastic Four. And now the Marvel Cinematic Universe has released She-Hulk, Attorney at Law, a TV series streaming on Disney+. It follows Jennifer Walters as she navigates the complicated life of a single 30-something attorney who also happens to be a large, green and super-powered Hulk. And at the show's premiere, the lead actor of the live-action series, Tatiana Maslany, said the story is relatable to everyday life. 
again, why I like felt you know connected to this script was that it, it did feel so kind of embarrassingly human, and it spoke, it, it gave words to things that I know I feel every day, and that isn't something I always see in a superhero story. It's often kind of a bigger allegory that feels like it's kind of beyond you, but but this feels like it hit some really simple, mundane truths that um, that I think a lot of women face. The nine-episode series was directed by Kat Koiro and Anu Valia, also stars Mark Ruffalo and Tim Roth. The show's baddie Jamila Jamil says it's important to have women tell the stories of women and has lauded the series creator Jessica Gao for doing such a great job. It's so refreshing to finally have our story told by us as we're seeing more in the last couple of years and Jessica Gao has pulled no punches. I mean, she almost also pulls out Marvel in and of itself in this show. Like she's, she, nobody is safe from Jessica Gao's watchful eye. The transformations are For actors and critics alike, She-Hulk's appearance in the MCU has been long overdue. And early reviews of the first four episodes suggest the wait has been well worth the while. Jenna Anderson describes the show as breezy, unabashedly weird and wildly entertaining. And in a post on Twitter, Rotten Tomatoes film critic Austin Burke says the tone is light-hearted, fun and comic accurate. Friend you had in high school. Well, as critics now wait for the remaining episodes, there's already some speculation that one of them will be an all-female Avengers movie. While it's nothing more than a rumor for now, if it does happen, fans should expect She-Hulk to play a major part. Tributes have been pouring in following the death of German director Wolfgang Petersen. Diane Lane, who starred in Petersen's film The Perfect Storm, called him a natural leader and a big loving soul. Peterson became renowned after he got two Oscar nominations for his World War II drama, Das Boot. Peterson was 81 years old. Ezra Miller has announced that they're seeking treatment for matters related to mental health. Miller apologized for their recent behavior and added that they are suffering from complex mental health issues. Most recently, Miller was charged with felony burglary in the U.S. state of Vermont and they were arrested twice this year in Hawaii for disorderly conduct and harassment. Apple TV Plus has released a trailer for the new documentary about late Sidney Poitier. Titled Sidney, the documentary was produced by Oprah Winfrey. It focuses on Poitier's career as an actor, filmmaker and activist during the civil rights movement. He died in January at the age of 94. And Johnny Depp is preparing to direct his first film in 25 years. It is a biopic about Italian painter Modigliani. Depp will co-produce alongside Al Pacino. The film tells the story of the painter and sculptor's life in Paris. According to The Hollywood Reporter, production will start in Europe early next year. Baroque era is known for its dramatic, exaggerated and, at times, bizarre aesthetics. Award-winning digital artist Jonathan Monaghan thinks this extravagant time in art history has many parallels with the excess of the digital age that we're in today. How? Let's hear it from the artist himself, whom I sat down with in Istanbul recently for his latest exhibition. Jonathan Monaghan, it's very good to have you with us today. Now, um, here in this exhibition called uh, Opulence. You liken the glamour of the Baroque era to our times, the aesthetic uh, of the times that we live in, but then the general understanding of Baroque is that it's dramatic, it's exaggerated, and sometimes even bizarre. I feel like today, the aesthetic we see around is a little more varied than that. Even looking at your exhibition, you are inspired by science fiction to classicism etc so tell us in that sense how did you come to this point where you're you know comparing the both yeah I think our aesthetics are very different in today's age but if you look at uh, the obsession that we have with material items and the obsession we have with 
wealth and power and a lot of the other aspects about our digital age, uh, I think we can draw a lot of comparisons to the Baroque times. And so in my work, I will often take the Baroque aesthetics and then reinterpret them and update them for the digital age. So what you liken between the two eras is not the aesthetic then, but then the system, the Baroque aesthetic is like the system today, yes. is what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. So I'm, I think I'm drawing back to the, those aesthetics of opulence and decadence and uh, really overwhelming power, you know, and that's what Baroque architecture was all about. It was meant to overwhelm the viewer. And I think our culture operates in a very similar way when we talk about our consumer culture and our commercial culture is very overwhelming. And so I think I try and draw those comparisons. Okay. Well, obviously, Baroque era came after Renaissance and uh, you know uh, mannerism, where artistic rules were broken. Um, so in that sense, it's almost served the purpose of you know shocking the audience and sometimes even um, perhaps um, you know helping the church. I guess I don't want to dig deeper into the topic, of course. But in that sense, what do you think this? Um, overwhelming shock is serving in our times today? Well, I think our, with our relationship to technology, technology moves so fast and um, technology can be very overwhelming and overpowering uh, for us. And so with my work, I try to offer an opportunity for my audience to reflect on our relationship to technology. And hopefully through that, my audience can gain some insights and some critical insights into our relationship with technology. So what I'm trying to ask is actually, we look at, say, your work or uh, the aesthetics around, and then we get shocked by the overwhelming weight of it. Where does this take us to? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure. You know, and I think as an artist, um, I'm not trying to say anything too specific. I think with my work and in the works you see in this exhibition, uh, it's an opportunity to reflect and it's an opportunity to have an emotional response to something and everybody is going to get something slightly different from it uh, but I hope that my audience can gain some new perspectives on our relationship to things like our consumer culture and our relationship to technology. Mm -hmm. I mean of course when you mentioned the Baroque era we definitely go back to the artistry and Baroque era was followed by Rococo mm -hmm which was even, you know, yeah. more uh, pronounced in terms of, uh, you know, it's a glamour, I guess. Do you expect this kind of a pattern to carry on after whatever the era, I mean, whatever you call the era we're in, but... I think there's different ways to look at aesthetics, and I think you can take a look at the social and cultural and the economic aspects of it, and I think you could also look at it um, in what the artists were trying to express and what the artists were trying to achieve, you know, and so... Uh, I like to do that, and I'm very influenced by these historical artists, and many of the works in the exhibition directly reference a lot of historical artworks from that period. But do you think the overwhelming quality of uh, our day and age, will it be even more pronounced in the future? Um, I think there has to be a, a tipping point, or there has to be a limit, right? Because there's so much information that we're exposed to every day, and I think it's very taxing for a lot of people just to operate in the world today with social media and with so much information, so much technology on all the time. And um, I think I always like to think of my works as like a therapy for this crazy, uncertain time that we're living in. You know, with all this information, with all this extravagance, I like to think of my works as a way in which people can maybe come to grips or reflect on that. And it is very interesting that this kind of um, reflection comes from a digital artist, an early adopter of the NFTs, really. So um, what, is it sort of cathartic for you to um, maybe even criticize uh, the power of uh, the technology and social media and uh, you know, the digital revolution, so to say, we're in right now? Yeah, well, I think throughout history, artists have always embraced new technologies. And this is something that I'm very much a, pro a pro proponent of. And I think we've seen that with like photography and the printing press. You know, these are very powerful technologies, very pa powerful forms of media that have really transformed the world and history. And artists have always been at the forefront of these things. So I think it's very important for artists to be at the forefront of all these new emerging technologies, such as NFTs. Um, and also things like social media. 
um, because having the artist's creative expression in these spaces is going to ensure that you know the human the the human the human aspect of these uh, technologies remains. You know. But then, uh, I mean, I'm reading my, from my notes here, you tackle subconscious anxieties associated with technology and consumerism, excessive dependence on technology, or even modern captivity of technology. I would imagine, after reading a press release like this, I would imagine that you would have never worked in a digital sphere, you know, where you never used technological tools. In that sense, do you find it to be at odds because you already are um, you know recreating this discourse yourself? Well, yeah, I think we have to. Um, for me, I, I like to engage with the media that I'm criticizing. You know, and, and I am critical of technology and our overdependence on technology. Um, but I think it's useful to use technology to make those criticisms um, because it helps. I think. Um, you know, technology isn't going away, right? You know, we can't just like give up on technology. It's part of our lives. It's an integral part of uh, the world today and society. And so we can't ignore it. We can't like just say, oh, I'm going to live in the past. Or I'm going to live in a hut, you know? And so we have to find ways in which we can make it work better with us and for us. And I think artists have an opportunity to do that by using these creative technologies to say something. Do you find yourself to be over dependent on technology personally? Yeah, I do. Um, but I think, you know, just like with everybody, you struggle with, um, you know, obsessing over social media or, or being addicted to scrolling through uh, social media. Um, but one thing I do with my work is I try and connect a lot of these ancient crafts, like, for instance, stone carving. Uh, the works behind me are part of a project where I did stone carving in marble. Um, and we were using technology in this process, but at the same time, we we're also employing uh, ancient uh, stone carving methods uh, to create artwork. So it's really linking uh, these ancient histories and traditions with a more modern day techno technological um, framework. Mm -hmm. Of course, we tackled it. I mean, we talked about the curatorial concept, but if I could ask you to perhaps briefly summarize uh, what is here in opulence. Um, yeah, so the works in this exhibition represent several years of my artistic practice and they involve a number of computer animated videos and a number of um, wallpaper prints. And the works range uh, from, they go back into 2015 uh, until today, and all of the works connect to this idea of our relationship to technology as I talked about. Uh, many of the works reinterpret ancient myths and stories, uh, such as that of the phoenix or the unicorn. Uh, these are ancient mythological figures and stories uh, that I am updating and reinterpreting for the present day. Mm -hmm. And um, you say that you want to push the viewer's boundaries with this exhibition. Tell us what exactly you want to achieve uh, with this exhibition. I mean, how do you want a viewer to leave this space with? I mean, what kind of thoughts? Well, I employ a lot of the same tools and techniques that are used in commercial forms of media, things like Pixar movies or commercials or video games. And my work maintains a very similar aesthetic to these commercial forms of media. And that gives my audience a entry point into the world because it gives them some familiarity and it makes the works a little bit accessible to everybody. Uh, however, the stories and the narratives are a lot more challenging and experimental and they're a little bit more difficult to understand what's going on. They're not the kind of stories that you encounter in these commercial forms of media. And instead, I think they are stories that challenge us to think critically about our relationship to technology, our relationship to our consumer culture, and our relationship to um, just the future and what our anxieties are about the future. So I want people to leave this exhibition with um, their own perspective changed a little bit about who we are and where we're going when it comes to technology. Okay, who we are and where we're going, my last question. Yeah. Um, how do you think we will remember these times when we, I mean, when it has a place in art history, when we look back from 100 years on, this is for future reference. <laughs> I mean, are, are these transitional times or are these times where transition itself becomes the character of it? It's a really good question. Um, you know, I think, as I said before, I think artists um, 
you know, when you look at history, artists have always been at the forefront of new technologies. And I think when we look back at this time, we're going to see just how important artists that are engaged with digital technology, how important their voice is, uh, because it lends a humanity to this digital technology that is so all-encompassing and that we can't escape from, you know? And so I think um, that is what's going to um, be the historical um, takeaway from this era. All right. We'll have to wait and see yes, if we can live not, long though. enough, I guess. <laughs> Thanks so much. It was right. lovely talking Thank to you. Thank you. Yes. That's it for this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. From me and the whole team here in Istanbul, thank you for watching and goodbye for now.